Welcome back. In the last video, we learned quite a bit about R syntax by typing in code, but let's just state a few additional points. R is case sensitive. The period has no special meaning in identifiers unlike other languages. See this variable right here, for example, solar.r. That's just an identifier name. The dollar sign does have special meaning. For example, df dollar sign wind selects the wind column. White space and R code is ignored. The R workspace stores all the objects you create in a session. You could save it, but for now you should always choose no when you exit RStudio and it asks you if you want to save the workspace. If you accidentally get objects saved in the workspace, you can delete them with the code we showed last time. This code will delete everything in the workspace. In this video, we'll review data exploration and talk about R control structures. The notebooks I have opened here, 2.1 through 2.3, give further examples of data exploration, and I encourage you to download those from the GitHub and run the code. Notebook 2.1 is the code we ran from the console in the last video, so I won't discuss it here. Last time we talked about markdown formatting in a notebook. I have added an author to the YAML code here. I've added a level 3 heading with these three hashtags. Here I have a bulleted list. Let's just quickly see how that renders. You may have the knit or you may have the preview button up top depending on if you've run it before. This may be a feature or a bug, I'm not sure, in the newest version of RStudio. But let's knit to HTML, and we see how that rendered here. All right, I'm not going to look any further at Notebook 2.1, so I'll close it out. Notebook 2.2 shows data exploration on the Titanic data. I'll just point out a couple of things here. We needed to convert some of the columns to factors. We can do that with as factor or with factor. The factor function gives us the additional option of specifying the levels. To encode a binary qualitative column, we just need one column. If we have more than one level, R will create dummy variables. So for passenger class, which has three levels, we need two columns. The base case has zero for columns two and three, and then we have a binary choice here between two and three for the other options. We'll look at that again when we get to the linear regression chapter. Notebook 2.3 shows how to load a data set that's included in a package. Packages must be installed before they are loaded. The library function, which I have commented out here, loads the function into memory, but only if it's already installed with install.packages. In contrast, the require statement loads the package and also returns a true-false value. This if statement here will check if mass is already installed. If not, it will install it and then load it. Further down the notebook, we see that I've attached the data set. That prevents us from having to type Boston dollar sign MEDV, Boston dollar sign tax, and so forth. It does have the disadvantage in that if you've loaded multiple data sets, you could have name collision. The last thing I want to point out in this notebook is how to add the AB line that you see over here in the rendering. This can help us visually determine a linear relationship in data. That's a review of data exploration. I'll close the data exploration notebook so we can move on to control structures. I've loaded the Pima Indians Diabetes 2 dataset from Package ML Bench and displayed information about it with STR. This line of code creates DF as a pointer to the same data frame. At this point, it looks like there's two in memory. There will be two in memory once I change DF. Since this is a small data frame, I'll go ahead and leave it in memory. The data frame has 768 rows and nine variables. Typing question mark, which is help, on the data frame, we get information over here on the meaning of the columns as well as the source of the data. I'm going to add a new code chunk here. 
by going to Insert and R. There are different keyboard shortcuts for that depending on if you're on Windows or Mac. And in this code chunk, I'm just going to play around with R control structures. Here is the form of an if-else statement. The condition must be surrounded by parentheses, and the block of statements is surrounded by curly braces. You can have an optional else statement. At the end of Chapter 2, I have some suggested R style guidelines. It's fairly common to have the open curly braces on the line of the if, and then a closing curly brace by itself, unless you have an else clause, in which case you have else open. This line of code will check if the first row, fifth column, which is the insulin value for the first data item, is checking if it's in A, which it is. And if so, it will print missing insulin value, otherwise it will print the value. There's also an if-else shortcut, which has this syntax. The three arguments in the if-else are the condition, what should happen if it's true, and what should happen if it's false. Let's comment out our original if with Control shift c on Windows or Command shift c on Mac and have a similar if-else, which is just going to print missing or OK for simplicity. And we see it printed missing. The for and while statements have familiar syntax. Condition is surrounded by parentheses, statements by curly braces. And here are two simple examples for reference. Here we're iterating through i from 1 to 5. And here we're doing the same thing in a while function. By the way, r doesn't have a plus plus or plus equal operator. You may be tempted when you're iterating over a vector to do something like this. Here we see that we created vector v, which is going to be the numbers 1 through 10. And then we iterated over that, replacing each element. Keep in mind that R has vector operations built in, which are really fast. So you don't want to use a loop if you don't have to. Do something like this. Here we create the vector again, and we just say v times 5, which will apply this operation to every element in the vector. Finally, let's look at how to create a function. The function definition gives it a name, specifies its arguments in parentheses, and the body of the function in curly braces. From this notebook, I've created a function I've called fill in a that's going to accept two arguments. One is a vector, and one is a flag indicating whether we want in a's filled with the mean or the median. This if statement will set m equal to the mean if the flag is 1, otherwise it will set it to the median. Then we can fill any na's in the vector with either the mean or the median. In an r function, you don't have to have a return statement. You can, but what r will return is the last thing evaluated, which in this case is our updated vector. Calling the function on these two columns got rid of most of the na's. Remaining ones were deleted with complete cases. One final thing I want to highlight in this notebook is the use of the sapply built-in function. sapply will apply a function to every column of a data frame. In this case, it's just an anonymous function which sums the number of NAs. As I mentioned before, there are links at the end of Chapter 2 for Google Style Guide and an R Style Guide by Hadley Wickham, who's a very influential R developer. The point of the recommendations is really to develop a consistent style in your code for readability. The end of Chapter 2, and most chapters in the book, is a summary section of key points, followed by quick reference code chunks for new code presented in that chapter. Be sure to always check that out. In the next video, we'll take a deeper look at data visualization in Base R.